the honor of speaking at the Clinton School of Public Service uh, is only enhanced by my uh, uh, profound admiration for the extraordinary work President Clinton uh, has undertaken around the world, from Africa to now Haiti, from disaster relief to the fight against AIDS. I must admit, though, that uh, I found the invitation to speak here a little intimidating. Distinguished and lecturer are two words that don't often appear in the same sentence with my name. Uh, my mother would be the first to tell you uh, that I've been on the receiving end of plenty of lectures, uh, but I can hardly keep company with my actually distinguished predecessors uh, on this podium. Uh, I'm having flashbacks uh, to my appointment as chair of the U.S. Holocaust Council when people started asking if I was a Holocaust scholar. I said I wasn't even a scholar, but, uh, but we're here. Uh, so I can't help but feel that you're being shortchanged a little on the distinguished business, but I'll make you a deal. Since you aren't getting a statesman or a scholar or other person of distinguished credentials, it's only fair that I spare you the lecture part too. So instead, let's just call this a friendly talk over lunch. And that's what it really should be. I want to talk to you today about genocide and about the moral character of societies and I want to suggest that they are the product not of the great figures who stand astride history, but the everyday people who actually shape it. If the Holocaust teaches one lesson that, it is, that is relevant to preventing genocide, it is just that. It's that the decisive moral choices do not fall merely to the kind of people who are invited, well, who are typically invited to give distinguished lectures. They fall to people like you and me. They don't happen in thunderous moments when spotlights are shining and cymbals are crashing and booming voices announce that a decision of deep historic meaning awaits. I don't mean to denigrate the importance of great historical figures. Still less do I mean to excuse historical figures from moral responsibility. The chances are excellent that a future president is sitting in this room. I'll lay odds a senator or two as well out of this great class that you've got, and probably more than one cabinet secretary. But I'm, I'm counting on the rest of you to make history. You see, the ethic of the Clinton School, indeed the name of the Clinton School for Public Service, tells me there is no question that this room is filled with people who will take up the often unsung but always critical mantle of making our public institutions operate day to day. You might do it from within the administrative agencies of government, or in elective politics, or maybe like me from the perch of the private sector. But wherever you serve, the choices you make, not in the spotlight, not in moments history is guaranteed to notice or ever to recall, perhaps not even in moments that will strike you as significant at the time, will tell the moral story of our society. That's a heavy burden. And right now, a few of you are prob probably thinking student loans, house mortgages, and now this. Well, yes, but this responsibility also comes, I promise you, and I'll try to explain in a few moments, with an enormous reward. A joy no other public pursuit in life can match. Because these moments of seemingly small moral choices are also the ones that make public service meaningful. The paradox of the Holocaust, historians have noted, was that it occurred in one of the most enlightened, some call it one of the most civilized societies on Earth, at least as conventional standards measured those qualities. Germany was a world-class center of philosophy and science and jurisprudence. Its people were highly educated. Its professional classes were vibrant. They were world leaders even Nobel Prize winners in many fields. Yet this entire apparatus of high culture, extraordinary knowledge, and exceptional competence was converted in an instant, in historical terms, to a massive machine of murder. I use the term machine deliberately. The Holocaust was not an eruption of violent rage. It was a carefully planned and executed program that depended on careful records and expert logistics and a kind of gruesome mecha mechanic, mechanistic competence. It was carried out, in short, by exactly the kinds of institutions 
staffed by exactly the kind of people sitting in this room and standing at this podium, you and me. Now try, uh, try on that again. When I said there was a president in this room, I bet many of you looked discreetly from side to side wondering who it was. If you didn't, you should, because I can tell you firsthand that knowing a president years before he or she is president can lead to a pretty interesting life. The dean and I talked about that before. I said, every time people say to me, how'd you get where you are? I said, it's real simple. Just get to be buddies with a guy and let him become president 30 years from now. That's all it takes. It's a little harder to look around and say, who's going to participate in a genocide? Who's going to sit by stamping forms and writing memos and never even noticing that decisions of enormous moral importance are being made? Who's going to be too busy with day-to-day -to -day life to notice, too concerned about the mortgage to risk standing up or standing out? Who's going to invoke one of the most common and pathetic excuses in history? I was only following orders. The answer, if we're honest, is that any of us could. And in Nazi Germany, many did. Not evil characters ordered up from central casting, but excruciatingly ordinary ones. This is the story of the Holocaust, too. Not just the story of those who issued orders, but of those who said yes. The story of the Holocaust is the story of train engineers who drove the cattle cars to Auschwitz, of mid-level legal bureaucrats who signed orders of deportation and execution, of manufacturers who produced the Zyklon B gas, of construction companies that won contracts to build Auschwitz, and the thousands of other concentration and slave labor camps, of academics who concocted justifications, of PR flacks who produced the propaganda and covered up the crimes of police officers who started out arresting criminals and suddenly, seamlessly, transitioned into arresting, torturing, and killing Jews. All of this is easy, too easy, for me to say from the clear perspective of hindsight. Those who fail to follow orders may have risked everything, their livelihoods, their freedom, their lives, their families' lives. Yet most of those who chose a different path to be bystanders, not perpetrators, were not punished. It's very difficult today to imagine the choices these people had what was going through their minds when faced through these choices. What we can imagine, however, is the unrelenting reality that ordinary people like you and me, and me face these realities, difficult choices in our lives, and that every student at the Clinton School will face them in your career a, a, in public service. And it will not merely be, it may not even primarily be, those who enter fields that we can readily associate with the enormous moral choices involved in genocide. This is the story our museum exists to tell. Our founding chairman, Ellie Wiesel, famously said that a, mu a museum unresponsive to the future would violate the memories of the past. We respond to the future. We shape it, not merely by telling the story of the Holocaust, but also by reaching out to those who will determine whether it reoccurs. I believe nothing we do will have a greater long-term impact than our work with the professions, with the physicians and military officers, the judges and the police officers, the teachers and the diplomats who come to our museum for special programs that help them explore the moral responsibilities of their work. And we shape it in equal measures by telling the stories not merely of moral failings, but of moral courage. For there are those who sat where you do, who stood where I stand, who met these challenges. The heroes of the Holocaust were by and large not men and women of great power, except the power each of us holds to act according to our moral beliefs. They were unlikely candidates for history. They were diplomats and bureaucrats, neighbors and friends. They were people who refused orders and people who inserted themselves into the jaws of danger when it would not have occurred to anyone to blame them had they stayed away. Let me tell you about one of them. His name was George Mandel Mantello. You can read his story on our webpage as some 30 million people actually do a year. 
It's also an, exa uh, an excellent example for our work to ensure the lessons of the Holocaust are learned, not just within the walls of our building, but around the world. Mandelo left Romania and worked in the unlikeliest of places for a hero of the Holocaust, El Salvador's consulate in Geneva. If there was anyone who could have stayed on the sidelines, indeed entirely off the field and out of the stadium, it was George Mantello. Geneva was a safe haven, and in both geography and interest, El Salvador was a long distance from the flames consuming European Jewry. But Mantello not only accepted, but actively sought the mantle of moral responsibility. Among, among other efforts, he saved thousands of European Jews by giving them Salvadoran citizenship. At the time of his heroism, Mantello bore responsibility neither for carrying out the Holocaust nor for stopping it. At the time of his death in 1992, few people knew who he was. George Mantello, in short, was the kind of person who shapes history and sets the moral cast of societies. George Mantello was the kind of person who decides whether genocide proceeds unabated or whether it meets resistance. George Mantello, in short, was ordinary and extraordinary, and exactly like nearly every future perfect servant at the Clinton School today. The question is whether we will choose to be like him. I can't say when those choices will cross your desks, only that they will that they are unlikely to be accompanied by thunderclaps, that their risks will almost certainly exceed any potential for glory. I can't say that these everyday moral choices will pertain to genocide, only that if genocide does come, this is the form it will assume, and these are the choices of which it will be made. And I can say that they will be the choices that will make public service as meaningful to you as it has been to me. As a little aside, I must tell you, I was speaking uh, at the St. John's School in Houston one day to their entire class. And for those of you who don't know, the St. John's School is probably the outstanding academic institution in Houston. And uh, I'm saying some of the very same thing I was saying here today. And I looked out at the students who were all high school students. And I said, I'll bet all of you uh, say, don't worry, this would never happen. I would never let this happen. I would speak out. And there was 400 and something heads nodding, yes, yes, yes. And I had a New York Times in my hand, and I said, how about if I show you right this minute, as we speak at this second, right here on page 17 of the New York Times, is the story of a genocide that is going on this very moment in Darfur. It is happening every minute that, that we are here. And it's not on the front page of the New York Times. It's on page 17, and none of you knew anything about it. Well, that night, I got calls from six different parents who, uh, who were friends of ours that called me and said, what did you tell my kid today? I said, why? He said, he came home screaming at me that I, didn't stop the, that I haven't stopped the genocide in Darfur. So anyway, I've done a great uh, many things in my life uh, by conventional standards. I've been arguably successful professionally. But no reward I could ever earn comes close, comes even close to close, to those extraordinary moments when public service forges a magical connection between you and the beneficiaries of your work. I felt it when I, when I had the opportunity to help rescue Texas Southern University, a historically black college in Houston from collapse, and watched as a trustee of that institution the joy on the face of young people as they walked across the stage and accepted a piece of paper and became the first in their families to graduate from college. And with a satisfaction that no words can convey, I have known it each time at our museum that I've looked into the grateful eyes of a survivor who knows that whatever uncertainties the future may hold, our promise never to forget is eternal and ironclad. Uh, when, when I submitted my resignation, this position is at the pleasure of the president. Uh, to President Obama, uh, he asked uh, if I, uh, uh, he would prefer not to accept it and ask me to stay on. Uh, I told him uh, that it was my honor and pleasure to stay on as long as uh, he uh, uh, felt that I was of value uh, to his administration. Uh, that's lasted 14 months right now. It, I haven't looked at my Blackberry in the last 
hour, so I don't know. I don't know if it's over now or not, but I expect it to come any time, and I'm glad it didn't come before we had this opportunity. I've had other opportunities for other avenues of service. You know, like I said, managing to be friends with a guy who gets himself elected president will do that for you, uh, as many of you know here in this room. But when my first term as chair of the museum was up and other political uh, opportunities floated by, none of them sounded right. Public service to me is, a, is about direct connection. And the job in which I couldn't look day to day into the eyes of people whose lives were changing, people to whom I was accountable, just didn't feel like public service to me. Maybe I could have done something else that the history books would record with more certainty. Maybe I could have made policies that affected more people or administered a budget with greater reach, but nothing I could do will ever make as clear and direct a human impact, and nothing I will do, I will ever do, will live up to seeing the impact in the beneficiary's eyes. I hope each of you will know that satisfaction. A few of you will know it from the pinnacles of power, but all of you can know it from the simple perspective of touching people's lives, and the simple satisfaction of knowing that your choices were part of improving law lives, not destroying them. That's quite a dichotomy. Pretty dramatic one, I guess. What can I say? Where I'm from, we have a certain tendency toward ex towards exaggeration. It's on the football field, right? But, uh, but I'm going to invoke another habit common among Texans, uh, a habit that's occasionally a virtue, often a really big source of irritation. I'm going to stick to my guns. Sometimes Texans do that from pride. This time, though, I mean it. I mean that the stakes in public service are that clear and that dire and that's stark. I mean it not because most of you will confront the choice of whether to participate, however indirectly, in genocide. In equal measure, I believe and I pray that none of you will, even though most of us will confront whether to act in the face of inhumanity elsewhere. I mean it mainly because genocide stands at the end of a long train of, dehum of dehumanizing behavior. It does not simply erupt spontaneously in societies where humanity was valued just the day before, although the experience in Nigeria the last two days was certainly a little bit of a shock, I believe, to everybody. At the other end of that train stands the everyday moments of life when we decide whether, whether one uh, another's humanity matters. Nowhere is that known better than here in Little Rock. These are the moments of direct connection not between historic figures and the millions under their sway, but between one person and another, between neighbors and absolutely between public servants and the beneficiaries of their work. By way of conclusion, allow me to make a related observation. The fact that you're sitting in this audience tells me two things. One is that somebody can print up a flyer that says distinguished lecture and you'll believe the lecture question is actually distinguished. I don't know whether that's to your credit, but it's certainly to my relief. The second is that your hearts are already inscribed with the most powerful barrier to inhumanity, the pure and simple commitment to serve. It is a barrier genocide simply cannot overcome. Every moment it is maintained, the odds of genocide are diminished. Every moment it is lowered, whether through conscious choice or inattention, whether for the sake of expediency are the fear of consequence, no matter how insignificant the stakes may seem, or how quiet the moment may be, genocide takes one small yet steady step from the inconceivable to the unavoidable. These are the choices of which your careers will be made and have been made. That makes the lessons of the Holocaust forever relevant, no matter what field of endeavor you're involved in. It makes genocide your responsibility to stop the character of our society, yours to determine, and the history of our world, yours to write. Thank you. And I will, I, and for those of you who read my bio, I'll take questions about anything other than how many games the Nationals are going to win this year. That's an easy one, not many, if any of y'all follow baseball. If you do raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you so everyone can hear. Do we have any questions? Ready? Mary Jane? A 
You know, I realize that there's genocide going all over the world to currently, but you know, back during World War II, the United States and the British certainly were engaged actively in the war, and we were already over there. I was just wondering what your thoughts were as why we didn't take more steps, you know, us and the British to end it, this. It, it, it's a, it's a, uh, I, I can't really ans answer for the British, although if you remember the British dealt with Hitler and said he's not going to be a problem, if you remember Neville Chamberlain, but uh, I, uh, I'm a jogger, and every day I jog through the FDR memorial trying to see if I can't find something in there that says we need to stop the genocide of the Jews in, in, uh, 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 in Eastern Europe. We, uh, I, I don't know why. I mean, we have, there is literature in the museum. Uh, my guess is uh, President Roosevelt did not want to get us into a war. He did not want to get uh, the United States involved in a war that he was not involved in yet at that point. Uh, we, have, we have photos of bombers flying over the camps at Auschwitz, people begging them to drop bombs, to blow up the camps, to blow up the railway, railroad lines. I mean, how many of the six million could have been saved for the 10,000 that might have been in the camp at that point in time? Uh, United States was very, uh, uh, not necessarily isolationist, but not wanting to get involved in a war. I don't know what went through their minds. We, I mean, we've, we've read it. Uh, it was, a, a, again, a small constituency that did not have a loud voice uh, in the United States at that time. Uh, I mean, the Jewish community did not speak out. Why did they? I, I, ask, I ask people all the time, I ask my parents, why?